Boy, what are we going to do about that Saul guy? That's what we're going to find out today in Acts 9. So it says that Saul was still breathing out threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. It's interesting because we knew that Jesus was going to be persecuted. He told the apostles they would be persecuted, but now the persecution is going across to everyone. Just common day Christians in common day churches were starting to get, just everyday Christians in various places were starting to get taken out too. Saul is just having none of it. So he goes to the high priest, Caiaphas, and Caiaphas, by the way, this is kind of interesting. They found the box that contained the bones and it says Caiaphas on there. It was highly um, decorative. So it was clearly someone who was a famous person. First people of the Bible that they found buried in Jerusalem. And so he wanted a letter, a official letter. It's, you know, it's kind of like going to the government and saying, can you give me an official letter? You think of in the back in the Wild West where they're going to go look for some notorious criminal can have an official letter that says, I'm from the government and I'm here to find this person. So he wants to get that official letter, which he gets. And that if he found any people in the way, men or women, he could bring them bound back to Jerusalem. So he wanted to haul everyone back who scattered. It's interesting they call it the way. And I know that in the 70s, when was it, 60s, 70s, you know, people called themselves the way. And I thought it was some sort of a hippie thing. But that was kind of their first name. They didn't become known Christians until much later. So he went and approached Damascus. And people felt that this was about 15 miles east of Damascus. Like he was almost there. Right now, I believe that if you were to drive in a car from Jerusalem to Damascus, it would take about four and a half hours. But walking there, that's a pretty good distance. As the crow flies, which is obviously how nobody can walk as the crow flies. It's about 136 miles. It would have taken a good amount of chalk. And remember that Saul was from Tarsus, which is in the sort of the southern part of Turkey. This is the place where Cleopatra met Mark Anthony. This is a very historic place. It's beautiful. And it has, boy, the whole history right there. It was ruled by the Hittites, sacked by the Assyrians, taken over by the Persian Empire, and then became a part of Alexander's Greece, and now it's part of Rome. (laughs) So it had a long history of time. This is part of the reason why they felt that Saul would have been a Hellenized Jew, someone who was very in touch with Greek culture because of where he grew up in. And there was even a, a philosophical school there that some people said was just as big as Athens and Alexandria. It also had a very large library. Think Again, like the Alexandria had the huge library. So it was a very educated place too. But that's where Saul is from. And so he's traveling. He's, they say, maybe 15 miles away to the east. And he approached it and suddenly a light shone from heaven. He falls to the ground. God says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul's just beside himself. He doesn't even know who he's talking to. And this, you know, think he's a Pharisee. Pharisees are all about serving God the Father. Every single rule, every single thing, knowing everything about it. And he would have known so much. He doesn't even know who he's talking to. And he says, this is from ESV, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city and you'll be told what to do. The men, it says, who are traveling with him, because remember, he's going to take people who scattered, tie them up and haul them back to Jerusalem. So he had people with him, and and they didn't see anything. So they led him and brought him to Damascus, and for three days he was without sight. And it says he neither ate nor drank. Now, I thought this was interesting because half the commentary said, well, he was fasting, you know, in horror of what just happened to him. And other people were like, no, he feels really miserable. He is blind. He just got this shock on this road. He was probably in shock mentally and physically. I don't think I would eat either. So, you know, it's hard to know whether he was fasting or if he just didn't eat anything in the shock. There was a disciple inside of Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, hey, he did not say hey. He said, Ananias. And Ananias had the better response. Not who am I talking to? 
Instead, he says, here I am, Lord. Rise and go to the street called Straight at the house of Judas and look for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying. He has seen a vision. A man named Ananias comes in, lays hands on him, and that he may regain his sight. And what does Ananias says? Well, you know, I heard about this guy. And he has done much evil to people who are saints in Jerusalem. He has authority. He can haul people away. Jesus said, go, he's my chosen instrument. He's going to carry my name before the Gentiles, kings and children of Israel. And quote, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Boy, there's a, there's a message right there. So I, I can, you can understand they don't want to deal with him. You know, they don't want, you know, I, I think you think of, you know, Osama bin Laden. Think of the person who you feel has caused more harm to your people than anyone else. I don't want to deal with him. Or are you sure you want to deal with him? I think Ananias seems pretty obedient. I think he was just asking a good question. God doesn't mind a good question. And so he does what he says. You know, he, he asks the question. God answers it. And he goes on his way to do exactly what God told him to do. One of the commentaries also pointed out that the straight street is the main east-west Roman road and a big promenade with large porches were on this because most of the streets, I guess, in that town are quite crooked. Ananias being very good. This is the better Ananias than the Ananias and Sapphira. We had a good one here. He goes in the house. He lays on hands. He tells him, he says, Brother Saul. The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me to you that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. He rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. Wow. I mean, this is a very quick turnaround. It's amazing what being in the presence of Jesus does to people. It immediately turns them around. Then it says, Saul proclaims Jesus in the synagogue. You know, now we can't shut him up. He can't help. But inside of Damascus, praise Jesus, proclaim Jesus, tell him he's the son of God. And people, it says, were amazed. Isn't this the guy who is causing all the havoc and hauling people back to Jerusalem to be in front of the chief priest? But Saul it says, increased the more strength and confounded the Jews who were living in Damascus by proving that Jesus was Christ. A couple days pass, the Jews there were like, come on, kill this guy. He won't shut up. So they make a plot to kill him, just like they plotted to kill all the rest of the apostles. They were watching the gate by day and night, it says, but the disciples took him by night and let him down through an open wall, lowering him in a basket. See, that's super smart. And so Saul's back in Jerusalem. Maybe that would be not the town I would go to, but now he's so full of God, he has to go back to Jerusalem. He tried to join the disciples and they were all afraid of him because of course they were. They didn't believe that he was truly being a disciple. I was listening to a variety of different pastors speak and saying that when you have missionaries in particularly dangerous areas of the world, there are people who will pretend to become a part of the church so they can get the names of all the people, so that they can bring people back and, and physically bring bodily harm to the church, burn the church down, murder people in their name. And it's all a trick. They're just pretending to be a church believer. And of course, as being a part of church, you want everyone who accepts the name of Jesus to be a part of you. But of course, people were very suspicious. And here's Barnabas, the son of encouragement, right? He took him in, brought him to the apostles and said, you know, saw him on the road to Damascus. He saw the Lord and now he's preaching boldly in the name of Jesus and been going out everywhere among people in Jerusalem and preaching the name of the Lord. And they're trying to kill him too. And so it says that when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Maybe you need a little distance right now because you're kind of a hot commodity at this moment and people are looking to kill you. So the church throughout Judea, Galilee, Samaria had peace 
and was being built up and walking in fear of the Lord and, and, and is just comforted by the Holy Spirit as it multiplied. It didn't just add. It didn't gain people here and there. It multiplied. He's taken back to Tarsus, where he's from. And, it, you know, it, we know that it took 14 years before he came back to Jerusalem. He continued his work there. It said that even people in Judea heard the reports of what was going to happen. We're going to find out about that in Galatians. But this was successful. This was great. Again, more dandelion spores going farther out because we send him back to Tarsus, where he also preaches the word of God. That's amazing. And here's taking a gigantic enemy of God. And we would know what we would think to do with him if we had the chance, you know, being in the church. Wouldn't it be nice if he just disappeared? Wouldn't it be nice if we could just tie him up and make sure that he doesn't haul anyone else away? There it could be some people who would want to get rid of him. God had a different plan. God always has a better plan. So Peter, he was traveling around and he came to the saints who lived in Lydda. And Lydda is a place that's on the way to Ashdod. So when we talked about Philip going from Ashdod to Caesarea, this would have been on the way on that route that was there. And he found a man named Aeneas, I think it's Aeneas, and who had been bedridden for eight years being paralyzed. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise from your bed. He gets up and the residents of the town there and Sharon, Sharon, saw him and they all turned to the Lord. The word is spreading even more, even in the, in the countryside. Now in Joppa, I love Joppa. That was really one of my favorite places. It's beautiful there. It's right on the coast. It's a gorgeous place. There was a disciple named Tabitha and Tabitha is the Greek name would be Dorcas. And she was full of good works and charity. And one day she died. They had readied her in an upper room to prepare for her burial. And since Lydda was near Java, the disciples heard. So, so Peter goes there because it's on the way and he meets two of the men. Please come with us without delay. Hurry, come with us. So Peter rose, went with them, arrives to this upper room and all the widows who stood beside him were weeping and showing all the clothes that she had made. She was of charity and making them clothes and garments. So Peter put them all outside, knelt down and prayed, turning to the body and says, Tabitha, arise. She opens up eyes. She looks around. He sticks out his hand to her and pulls her up, gets her out of the bed and calling the saints and the widows, showed them, here she is, she's alive. And it became known through all of Joppa and many people believed. And he stayed there in Joppa for a while with someone who was Simon the Tanner. This would be a different Simon. So a lot of Simons, right? Maybe this is our, yeah, maybe our third Simon. But anyway, boy, I wish I had known when I was in Joppa that this was all there. I knew some of the Greek mythologies that took place there, but I didn't know any of the Christian things. I, I want to go back. If you're looking for some miles, it's about 38 miles from Jerusalem. I think as the crow flies, it's like I said, along the coast. And that ends Acts 9. What I'm going to meditate on this week is that fact that Saul was going to be the person who talks to the Gentiles and kings and queens. Jesus knew his role before even Saul knew what his role was. It's always interested me quite a bit how you'd think that Saul would be the perfect one to talk to Jewish people. He understand Judaism. He, you know, had connections in the temple. People probably would have respected that, although they'd be probably afraid of him too. But God always knows the right place to put people. One of the interesting things to me is that I know when I became a Christian, what interested me the most. And I'm not saying that that's really what God sent me to do, but I love I guess, apologetics or explaining what something means. See, you, you know, to, to people who are like, well, if the Bible means this, then how come that? Oh, you, you have the whole wrong intention. That always became my thing. And yet I had a Jewish background. I knew enough about Judaism. That doesn't seem to be where I feel set, you know, to go back and speak to Jews. And 
I will speak to Jesus. I'm not saying I'm old, but I'm just saying it seems like it's interesting how I still think that God sees our gifts and talents in a way and puts us in that right spot. What I'm going to pray about is the fact that people need to see other people like God sees them. I think that's where Barnabas comes in. He does look at people the way Jesus looks at people. He has that talent. I think that's why that he's the son of encouragement. He understands God's heart. And I hope that we always look at people with God's heart. It will be easy for us when we see someone who was against the church or is violently mean towards the church, or even if someone who is a persecutor, violence against the church, follows Jesus. I hope that we can see other people the way God sees them. And what I'm going to share with others is that fact that God has a purpose for everyone. He knows where you're going to be sent, what you're going to do, and there's a place for you. There's always a place in God's ministry for you. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember, I have a website, abetterlifeinsmallsteps.com. That is where all the podcasts are, and a little small blog is there too. I hope you get a chance to check out the website, and if you have any questions, you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. Thank you so much. <music>